Hello and welcome from rainy and beautiful Scotland, uh, where the Conference of Parties 26 is now running out uh, um, the second week. And we are happy to welcome you on our offline and online combined event with fantastic speakers today, which is entitled as Fossil Fuel Divestment, Climate Justice and Just Transition for All. Please uh, just put your names in the chat, introduce yourselves and type us uh, and let us know where uh, are you where are you watching us from and we will be uh welcoming you and um, asking a questions and having a q a session at the end and now we will have a panel of six speakers and one video presentation which we see in the middle and we will start from introducing uh, today's event and introducing myself, I am Dr. Svetlana Romanko. I will be moderating today's event on behalf of Laudato Si Movement as a zero fossil fuel campaign manager for Laudato Si Movement, formerly known as Global Catholic Climate Movement. And we are uh, welcoming our first speaker and our dialogue on a just transition, who will be Lorna Gold. And, but before, uh, I would like to start by thanking our partners, Operation Noah, Green Anglicans, World Council of Churches, Green Faith, CAFOD, Christian Aid, SCIAF, Cheer Fund, Eco Congregation Scotland, and the Laudato Sea Movement team who have made this event possible today. Um, this is, again, a reminder that this event is set up both as an online and in-person event. We will welcome our speakers shortly and uh, save all Q&A uh, session to the end. If you have any questions, please send these in our Q&A boxes and we will ask them in the end to each speaker. You can upload questions by clicking the thumbs up icon. Please direct questions to specific, specific speakers if you can. So let us begin and we are delighted to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Lorna Gold, who is the chair of Loud Data Sea Movement and Movement Building Director for uh, Face Invest. And she previously worked at Jakar, the official overseas development agency of the Catholic Church in Ireland and supported the Irish Bishop Conference to divest from fossil fuels in 2018. She's acting chair, uh, as I've said, of both of the whole board of directors of Laudato Sea Movement and a member of the Vatican's COVID Commission Economic Task Force. She also lectures part-time in climate justice and social policy at Maynus University, Ireland. Please, Dr. Lomna, go to the floor is yours. Thanks, Svetlana. It's, it's so lovely to be here today, also to, to meet everybody who's here in person, but also all the people do, who are joining us online. I'm going to just give a little bit of an overview of um, the impact that um, faith divestment has had and talk a bit about the experience of the Irish and the Scottish bishops divestment in, in recent years. I think it's fair to say that the impact of faith divestment institution, insti faith institutions that have divested has been very, very significant. Um, overall, the divestment from fossil fuels movement over the past five, six years has grown to a th over $39 trillion uh, in assets. That sum um, is made up of many, many different institutions over 1,500 institutions in total. Of those 1,500, 500 are faith institutions. They roughly represent 35% of the overall uh, institutions who have divested from fossil fuels. And then of those 500 faith institutions, 307 are Catholic institutions. So Catholic institutions make up at present a disproportionate number of the overall faith institutions that have divested. And this, in my view, is not surprising. Um, faith investors have long been um, engaged in negative screening of their investments. In fact, they could be seen to be first movers in this area. Um, in right back as far as the 1980s, 1990s, um, screening out many areas of investing that they regarded as, um, in the Catholic world, you could say, sin, sin investments um, in other faiths, um, investments that were not aligned to faith values. So faith institutions really make up the largest number of values-based investors um, that have taken the step to divest from fossil fuels. And it was a fairly easy, in some ways, step to make. 
um, from a, let's say, from a, a kind of intellectual point of view, because if you're already engaged in screening out things that you regard as wrong, uh, taking the step to screen out uh, the most egregious offenders in terms of uh, causing ecological damage was one additional step. Um, it, it involved in the Catholic world, I think, a, a major step change when Pope Francis issued Laudato Si, because Laudato Si in many ways enabled the Catholic community to catch sea that really enabled the Catholic Church with a bit of um, support from uh, theological support and practical support from uh, organizations like Trocra, like Skiaf, to take the bold step of announcing their divestment from fossil fuels. I have, a, I was lucky enough a, back in 2017 to meet Mark Campanali, who's, who's next to me, and someone who'll be known to many people, Bill McKibben, in 2015, actually, when he came to Ireland ahead of the COP. And it was a very um, impactful um, visit. He stayed for a very short time, but in that time, um, in a sense, awakened the Catholic Church in Ireland to the need to divest from fossil fuels. And not just the Catholic Church, the entire country. Um, and Trocra, as the Catholic development agency of the, the bishops, engaged then in a process of really awakening the whole country to the need to take this step to divest. And with the support of Carbon Tracker, um, Mark um, and um, Bill McKibben and others involved in 350, we were really behind a massive nationwide campaign which resulted not only in the Catholic bishops divesting from fossil fuels, but also the Church of Ireland, more recently the Presbyterian Church, um, and importantly, the universities. Maynooth University was the first where Trocra is based, um, and then many universities that divested. And then eventually the government itself passed a law uh, to become the first country in the world uh, to, um, to divest its sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuels. That big win in terms of the climate movement and divestment movement would not have happened without the faith institutions. They were key to ensuring that this was a wider societal shift um, towards fossil fuel divestment. So similarly, before the COP, uh, the Catholic bishops in Scotland have made this move. And many of us, some people who are not here today, including Francis Gallagher from Justice and Peace Scotland, who played a really key role, uh, James Buchanan, uh, myself, working in partnership with the church here, um, being in some ways a critical friend to the bishops, offering them support and enabling them to move forward and make a decision to divest from fossil fuels. Um, and what has always been important and is that we have couched our engagement with the faith institutions in terms of theology and practical expression of faith. And this is what, what is, in my view, the, the, what is most fruitful when it comes to engaging with faith institutions. Divestment is not outside the faith, the realm of faith, how we use our money how we invest, what we choose to give our, lend our energy to, our support for, is part of our faith. And it's part of what Pope Francis would call an ecological conversion. And in fact, both with the bishops in Ireland and with the bishops in Scotland, it has been through embracing an understanding of Laudato Si on care for our common home that the whole idea of divestment has made sense. Of course, divestment is not the last word in this story by a long shot. We need to engage in a just transition. And especially in Scotland, where the oil and gas industry employs so many people still, and there are many families dependent on that industry. It's unthinkable that this this the industry would be um, like that divestment would be the last word. There needs to be government support. There needs to be um, a, a firm support for for a just transition. 
And at the same time, that needs to be extended globally and in, needs to also be part of a fight for climate justice. And I think there's a lot of work that faith communities can do through connecting communities affected by the, the need for a just transition here in Scotland with that same, uh, with the fight for climate justice in the global south. And the COP, in fact, has been a really important moment through SCIAF, through other agencies of bringing people together to help those in positions of power to understand how this transition affects us all. It also involves us thinking beyond divestment because without a transition in the finance industry, as I'm sure Mark is going to talk about, um, we won't reach the goal that we want. Divestment also has to lead to a bigger shift in terms of how faiths come together to think about what it means to engage us in faith and consistent with faith in how we invest. So a mixture of positive investing is, is really needed in order to tackle those big climate challenges and a just transition. And I'm happy to say that together with Faith Invest, Operation NOAA, and the Laudato Si Action Platform, a lot of thinking is now happening on how we can support the major faith bodies to rethink their investments and engage in a combination of faith consistent investing in line with ESG and also a much deeper commitment to impact investing, um, especially in the developing world. So we're at the start of a very long journey in terms of using divestment as a springboard for a wider transition in terms of systemic change as part of the, the, the global transition of finance that's needed to deliver our climate goals. But I think that the key thing here is that faith matters faith institutions matters, faiths are major stakeholders in the financial world. And what we as faith do can send a huge prophetic message, but also a substantial message in terms of finances in this fight against climate change and for a livable future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Londa, for invaluable, uh, very valuable insights and interconnection you've made between uh, climate justice and just transition, and of course, divestment from fossil fuels and going even beyond and to achieving uh, ending fossil fuels in upcoming years. Um, as this, accordingly to IPCC report, humanity, which I believe we are all, all just well know about. So, and uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Mark Campanella, our next speaker, who is the founder and executive chair of the Carbon Tracker Initiated, uh, Initiative and conceived the unburnable carbon thesis. Prior to forming Carbon Tracker, Mark had 20 years experience in sustainable financial markets, having served on the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, working group on capital markets, leading up to the 1992 Earth Summit, as well as the steering committee of the UNEP Financial sector initiated. Uh, Mark, is, uh, Mark is the founder director of the UK Sustainable and Respons Responsible Investment Forum and the visiting lecturer at the University of Cambridge's Sustainable Finance Programme. Mark, it's over to you. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I, was in a, I was in a cab on the way to a reception here at the COP and, and I was chatting away with the, the taxi driver and uh, he was driving a diesel taxi and I was asking him, well, how, how much does it cost you to run your, your, your diesel taxi? And he was saying he spends about 200 pounds a week on just diesel just to take people around town. And then he's spending um, around 300 pounds a week on leasing this, ta this taxi. Um, and, I, and I was sort of thinking about it because we're in the middle of this huge clean energy transition. Uh, if, you, if you'd switched your, your, your car to um, your cab to electric, um, you're going to be spending probably about 40 or 50 pounds a week and the lease cost is going to be probably half. And so uh, when we were talking about it and the only thing really preventing you from making that, that leap is, uh, is this, there's a more expensive cost of the cab, but I can see an immediate pathway uh, that the world, um, when we move to a low carbon future is just going to be so much better for the citizens. So, I mean, the papers today with high ga gas prices uh, people are saying, well, you know, renewables is never going to deliver this, and we're paying these ridiculous high gas prices. And the problem um, is not too little 
uh, fossil fuels. It's too much fossil fuels. We've got the world, a few suppliers like Russia and Kazakhstan and a few other countries dictating our prices. But if we had clean energy, uh, which is just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, there's going to be this fantastic um, dividend to be paid to the ordinary citizen in terms of more stable prices and cheaper costs. And I open those remarks, really, because we're the first generation, um, if you think about it for a minute, we're the first generation in human history uh, to not have to burn something to heat ourselves uh, or to cook um, or to go from A to B. We can do all of that. We can move from A to B um, with an electric car using electrons. We can heat our homes and we can power ourselves and, um, and we can cook. So we're going to be living in a very, very, very different world. Uh, so my, the great optimism that I have is that renewables are just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, and, and that has to be the good news. And the real question that we face is, can we deploy the, our financial resources, whether it's a pension fund or the assets of, of, of faith groups, um, the church is here, um, into this clean energy revolution? So I'm, I really want to sort of make sort of three, three remarks. One is the first on the science. How much um, CO2 can we release before we go through different warming? Um, what is the fossil fuel industry doing? We need to talk about it. The third is how the technology revolution is changing the way investors think about the sector. And then if I have a little bit of time, I want to talk about how we come to the end of the fossil fuel age. So carbon budgets. Um, if, we, if we were in a car and drove just straight up into the atmosphere, it will take us about five to seven minutes at normal driving speed before we sort of exit the atmosphere um, into space. And we, we live in this very fragile ecosystem where the world has this just a very, very thin layer around it into which we put all of the um, warming gases, the carbon dioxide and the methane that we keep pumping out in the, in the, in the millions of tons of CO2 a day. Um, and at the moment, we release around 41 gigatons of carbon dioxide. You can ask me what a gigaton is. It's a lot of CO2 um, each year. Um, and yet we, can only, we only can release around 300 gigatons before we go through one and a half degrees. Now, my maths isn't terrific, but we work out that we have about seven years left before we go through the conditions associated with one and a half degrees. We have about another 15 to 20 years before we go through two degrees. And we've not seen that level of warming in, in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And we'll do that within the lifetimes of many of us sitting in our room. So time is against us. So the first thing is the carbon budget tells us that we must stop burning fossil fuels. And the International Energy Agency, um, and I bumped into Fatih Birol, who's the executive director here at the COP, and, and we were talking about it, is that they've said that to avoid one and a half degrees and and and, and it's not 350.org, it's not <laughs> Extinction Rebellion, it's the International Energy Agency. We must, there's no space for any new investment whatsoever in coal, oil, and gas, starting from now. That's the drawing line. No new investment. He didn't say there's some investment. He said no new investment. So there's no space for any new coal, certainly no um, oil and gas. Now, there will be some maintenance because we need health and safety, and these things need to be managed into decline, but no new investment. Uh, so that's very, very clear. So um, knowing the science and knowing um, what the energy modelers are telling us, what are the companies that sit in our many people's pension funds? What are they doing? Well, the reality, and this is Carbon Tracker's research, in my group, there's about 30 to 40 analysts at Carbon Tracker, and there's more in the Tracker group. I've got people like the old head of oil and gas at HSBC. I've got the ex-head of research with Deutsche. So we're very kind of financially driven. Um, so we analyze the plans of Exxon and Shell and BP, the ones that you'll find typically in the pension fund. Um, they're planning a huge expansion plan. We, know, we, we do understand this, don't, don't we? They're going to invest around a trillion dollars in projects which we know are not needed in a an one and a half degrees world. Who, who are leading this expansion? It's Exxon. It's Chevron, it's, it's the real, the large fossil fuel companies, it's the energy traders, it's the coal companies. Um, and they know this, even though they know there's no space. And, and why did they do this? It was because their shareholders uh, allow them to do this. So the divestment movement isn't making 
uh, just a moral choice, but that's important that we make um, clear moral choices. It, we, we have to make financial choices. There is a better and wiser use of that capital. In my view, they should be doubling, tripling, quadrupling their investments in clean hydrogen. They should be spinning out their uh, wind businesses and expanding their wind businesses. And when we hear um, about, um, well, let's engage with the boards of these companies. Well, if, if you think about it, what, what are we actually asking them to gauge over? What we're trying to do is defend the technology that's been around for 200 years. It's called the internal combustion engine. It's these companies' business model is based on you fire something up in an engine, which we haven't changed much in 200 years to move from A to B. We, we, we don't need to do that. Um, it's a bit like um, owning shares in Blockbuster. You remember Blockbuster? Um, there were 80,000 people working in Blockbuster. You know, there was, a, was there a just transition for those 80,000 workers at Blockbuster? We used to have to go down the video shop and book it in, and, and then we'd pay a fine if we took it back late. And all of a sudden, Netflix, Netflix arrives. We're going to live stream our videos. We don't need to go down to the shop anymore. Um, were the shareholders saying, no, let's engage with Blockbuster for another 10 years? Let's engage for better videos. No, they didn't. The shareholders made a very simple decision, which was to sell Blockbuster by Netflix. It wasn't complicated um, at all. It was a technology change. And we have technology changes throughout history from canals to the railways, from railways to cars, and today from fossil fuels to clean energy. Uh, so engaging to try and stop um, and defend a traditional technology is, is really not in my view, a sensible thing. And people wave the flag of fiduciary duty. I mean, the reality, there's no fiduciary duty to invest in bad companies. And as a fund, ex-fund manager, um, my job was to, to, to sell what I thought were badly positioned companies and buy companies which were part of a sustainable future. And that, to me, is really the role of an investor uh, in the future and why, why many are exiting fossil fuels. So um, there's a clear financial case for what we're doing. And did everyone spot? that Tesla is, is now a trillion dollar market cap company. Who would have thought five years ago, the richest man in the world is a renewable energy tech, technology entrepreneur, not a coal entrepreneur or an oil entrepreneur, a renewable energy. And it just reflects where we've gone. So my last comments, I'm gonna sort of stop here, which is what, so what does the future look like? And, um, and it's two things. One is we have to, as we divest, we have to invest. We have to invest in the future of these technologies. And there's a billion people without access to clean energy in the global south. We should be finding the right pathways to support access to energy at the village level, at the consumer level. Uh, we should be doing that. But we do need to get off fossil fuels. And the thing that we forget is the Paris Climate Agreement. There are four, five words that are not in the Paris Agreement. They are oil, coal, gas and fossil fuels. They're the five words not in the Paris Agreement. And here we are in Glasgow trying to deal with climate change. It's a bit like um, trying to uh, get off smoking and not being allowed to talk about cigarettes. I mean, that's, that's the sort of the situation we're here in the COP. Uh, so I think, and, and faith groups in the past led this, those that went through CND in the 1950s and marched for the campaign for nuclear disarmament, led by church groups, is we need uh, what a number of us are calling a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. We need to get citizens, nations, churches around the table to say, let's give up our production permits. Let's give up our rights to fossil fuels. And let's, ne let's negotiate away all these permits that governments are still handing out, knowing the climate science. And let's have a, a citizen-led uh, agreement that drives governments to talk about the real problem here, which is um, the fossil fuel industry. And let's, let's be clear about that's where the challenge is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you for making this very visible and really clear that we must stop and end all fossil fuel exploration and expansion, not only uh, in our countries, but also in the countries of the global south, as you've said, and uh, invest in investing in interrenewable energy, because there are a lot of opportunities for clean and green investments, which I assure uh, will become a moral and ethical choice for popular, not only for our faith institutions, but for many people who will be joining our powerful faith movement uh, in the next years as well on divestment and green investment. And continuing this story and continuing this narrative 
which will lead us to a clean energy future. I would like to uh, invite all of us to uh, see a short film from Bishop of um, um, uh, uh, Nampula, Ernesto Manuel uh, in Mozambique on Southern African Anglican Bishop uh, who calls to end uh, gas, oil and coal exploration in Africa. Maybe have the video, please. I am Bishop Manuel Ernesto, the Bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Nampula and the Cabo Delgado in northern Mozambique. I joined uh, the church and the, the bishops in, in southern Africa and in, in Africa in general in the calling for a moratorium, um, a hold on fossil fuel uh, prospection in Africa. Fossil fuel uh, prospection comes with uh, a high um, environmental and the social costs. We know that uh, the prospections are happening in the very sensitive uh, areas with um, rich ecosystems. But we know also that uh, the prospections are happening in uh, very ancient communities. So uh, here in our diocese, uh, for example, in the diocese of Nampula, we have over one million people are displaced in the capital Gado. And we know that all began with the development narrative and the extractions industries coming to the area. So it is our prayer and our appeal that the world and Africa will come together in making a direct transition to clean energy. Africa has enormous potential in solar energy. So it is it's a time and opportunity that Africa uh, and the world um, uh, act responsibly in protecting the environment and in uh, protecting the local communities. So I thank you. Uh, and we are grateful to Bishop Ernesto Manuel who made this video for us and who had who said very important words uh, on stopping fossil fuel uh, expansion in uh, countries of the global south as an ECOP, as we all know, this is so harmful exploration, which endangers a lot of uh, lives and families and species and nature in general. And just the breaking news from this morning, the fossil fuel lobbyists on this COP26, the number of them exceeds much the number of civil society observers. So in these circumstances, we need to Stay, we need to stay up and uh, call to end in fossil, fu fossil fuels, uh, being very proactive just to fight this uh, very powerful fossil fuel lobby as well. And uh, after this wonderful video, we are uh, welcoming Bishop Olivia Graham, who is, has been serving as a Bishop of Reading in the Church of England Diocese of Oxford since 2019. She previously served as an Archdeacon of Berkshire in the same diocese, diocese for six years. Bishop Graham served as a teacher in Africa from 1974 to 1981 and returned to England to study at the University of East Anglia. She then moved into international development, working for United Nations and Oxfam in the early and late 18s. Please, Bishop Olivia Graham, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Just a small correction, I never worked for the United Nations, but I did work for an NGO that was funded by the United Nations. There's a subtle distinction there. Um, it's really lovely to be with you this afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm here, I think, as the lead bishop for the environment for the Diocese of Oxford, um, and also as one of the three uh, bishops um, who sit on the environment working group of the Church of England. Um, I'm delighted that Oxford Diocese is one of the now three Church of England dioceses which have divested from fossil fuels. I supported this decision, I pushed for it, and I hope that many other dioceses will follow very soon. Um, Norwich declared its, um, its, uh, its desire, its, its commitment to do this, in fact, last Saturday. Um, and I think that we may start to see a domino effect now. That's what I'm very hopeful of. Um, for us, the, um, we had been talking about these issues for a long time, but in March 2019, um, our diocesan synod declared a climate emergency and um, and set a 2035 net zero target. Um, earlier this year, we divested um, from the fossil fuel sector and um, we are 
working towards our net zero target by 2035. We've diverged a little bit from the Church of England target, which is 2030, um, for a, a number of reasons. Um, we are grateful to the Church of England for setting that very high bar of ambition uh, for net zero. Um, and we also think that it, for us, it's not realistic and we would prefer to take um, a, a rather slower um, approach. We think that some of the technologies we will need to rely on haven't yet been fully developed. Um, and uh, it's better to, uh, to not spend money and then have to spend it again um, a little bit further down the line. So um, uh, I, I can provide information for anybody who wants to know the whys and wherefores of that, but, um, but that's where we are. Um, net zero, of course, means um, that emissions are balanced by uh, removal of carbon from the atmosphere and offsetting what we can't um, reduce. Our net zero plan as a diocese encompasses clergy housing, church, schools, travel, and some elements of procurement. And we've prioritized genuine reductions for a wide range of activities over offsetting um, and a wider range uh, of in-scope activities. That's partly why we've got a 2035 target. Net zero is a difficult and complicated business. I had no idea when we went into this uh, exactly how many spreadsheets it, it meant. Um, first, um, the first two years of our net zero um, journey have been primarily um, planning around ensuring accurate data and solid processes and working out the pace and timing of what we're doing in relation to national policies, uh, such as decarbonisation of heat, and also our own, um, uh, our own staffing and, and, and financing of this journey. Um, and we're also working hard to help parishes, which you may or may not be aware are self-standing charities. Uh, we don't control them in that sense um, as a diocese. We're helping the parishes to assess and plan for their own pathway to net zero. Um, we need to get a really robust baseline about the reality of our carbon emissions. Um, so church energy use, clergy housing, data from schools, data about staff transport. Um, and we're working hard on all of this. It's taking up an enormous amount of staff time. We've got some wonderful interns who've been working with us. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a slow and painstaking business. Uh, and we're working to help churches um, access the environmental goods and services that they need to take things forward. Um, and we're continuing to encourage all of our churches to switch to renewable tariffs. Um, I am slightly hesitating to do this, but I think I want to address head on an elephant which is in the room before I get asked about it. And that's the fact that the church commissioners and the Church of England Pension Fund are not divested. Now, I know that there are those in this room, and we've heard from some of them, um, and also probably on the, uh, on the call, who are very, very critical of this approach. And I'm not here to speak for the church commissioners, but here is what I want to say about this. Currently, uh, as you're all aware, um, there are three positions for shareholders. The first position is that you can sit back and enjoy your money um, and look for a maximum return on it. That's not an approach which is going to help the planet, and it is an approach which is going to cause further damage to the planet. And then there are two other approaches, both with the same end objective in view. And I think we want to hesitate before we demonize either of these. Um, there's divestment so that you mark a clear line, or there's shareholder engagement, which is looking to bring change. In the case of an individual diocese, I definitely support divestment. That's what we've done. That's what we're committed to. Uh, we're relatively small. We don't have the resources to engage with the oil and gas companies. But when we divest, we do need to be aware of certain things. First, that the shares that we're selling don't just disappear. When they're sold, in all probability, they will be bought up by those who aim to drill more, to extract more, to profit more, using their major shareholder clout to press for that. So while we may feel that we've done the right thing, that's not an overall moral win. The second thing is that we, I think we all need to recognize our current dependence on fossil fuels. Many of us get into fossil fueled cars. I'm fortunate enough to have an EV, 
but it was paid for by the church commissioners, not out of my pocket. Um, so, you know, I, I take no credit for that. Um, most of us live in homes which are heated with fossil fuels. Um, many of us, most of us have been given COVID injections with hydrocarbon made plastic syringes. The global south is particularly reliant on generators where the scale of renewables has yet to be developed. Cutting off diesel and gas to them will have a major impact on lives and healthcare. And of course, the resources which are needed to develop the photovoltaic panels and the wind turbines consume vast quantities of extracted minerals that need to come from somewhere, most probably the global south. Now, there's a whole can of worms here that we're not going to open up today, I don't think. Um, uh, but there are issues here about the mining of these minerals, about the labor conditions, about the indigenous land rights and so on. You, you get what I'm talking about. So uh, it's not straightforward. Uh, on the train today, I was chatting with a Nigerian delegate who said that for his country, divestment in fossil fuels would be a disaster if it were done immediately. The whole economy, the, literally the whole economy is built on oil and it's going to take them a long time to transition. And what he said to me was, we need to walk in each other's shoes. The third thing is that many of the fossil fuel companies clearly defending their own futures are in the vanguard of hydrogen and other alternative energy developments. And that's only going to happen through investment. Now, I know that each individual oil company, fossil fuel company has got its own, um, its own route to this and some are credible and some aren't credible. Um, uh, and there's, there's discernment to be done here. But I think I want to say that whilst I am fully supportive of my diocese decision on divestment, um, and I would be fully supportive uh, and encouraging of other dioceses to do the same, I do understand the logic of the church commissioners and the Church of England Pensions Fund policy, which was agreed by our general synod, the policy of engagement. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about the transition pathway initiative and all of that. But it is a complex question, and it comes down to the age-old theological dilemma uh, of balancing purity with kingdom messiness. Um, because good and faithful Christians hold different views on the right method to reach the same result. And I feel comfortable with that. Perhaps that's because I'm a good Anglican. Um, there are, of course, other questions about the holding of fossil fuel investments. Uh, CCLA, which is a huge fund manager and an awful lot of uh, Church of England funds are in CCLA, um, decided to divest for financial rather than ethical reasons. Um, and that's, that's interesting in itself, but it doesn't mean that they won't reinvest uh, if they think that that's the right thing to do. They haven't made that, that um, a principled decision. And of course, uh, we'll have heard discussions around whether those who hold on to fossil fuel stock may be taking the greater risk of finding it worthless by 2035. I'm no expert on any of this. I'm not an expert on finance. I'm not an expert on the, the mechanics of any of this. I'm not a scientist. And I'm fascinated how very quickly it all gets technical. For us, uh, the next uh, few years are going to be increasingly about creating partnerships, about working on behavior change, um, about no regret infrastructure, elements of decarbonization and trialing some new technologies um, and, uh, and hopefully um, beginning uh, larger scale work on infrastructure. Um, we've heard already about um, the Just Transition, the, the Grantham Institute's uh, Just Transition report, I think is being launched on Friday. It's very timely. They speak of an unprecedented reallocation of capital, which will drive more and more, more and better quality jobs, revitalize communities and reduce inequality, as well as delivering essential emissions reductions. The focus of this agenda is about ensuring the benefits and costs of change are fairly distributed. It's absolutely crucial that we get this right. And behind all of this, there's the global capitalist system. And lots of us have been talking a lot about this this week. Um, I was sent a fascinating paper um, earlier in the week uh, by a chap called Duncan Austin, I don't know if any of you know him, um, who talked um, very interestingly about how back in the uh, late 18th, 19th centuries, um, there was a reframing of greed from being a vice to being a virtue. Uh, and that's really where the trouble started. 
And I think that we have a challenge here to, uh, to change the way that we look at greed, which is the basis of our capitalist system. Um, and we frame that as a vice again. Uh, and we just need to wonder what it's going to take to do that. I've been very struck by listening to lots of different voices in the past few days. Um, my, my, my Nigerian friend on the train this morning saying that a future without oil for his country is a terrifying prospect for ordinary people. Uh, I had listened to James Bagwan talking about how very few delegations there are here from the Pacific nations. Um, I've listened to young people's voices of hope and young people's voices of anger and grief. And I've listened to uh, indigenous voices and the pain and grief uh, and impact um, which all of this is having on those who are really on the front line of climate change. Um, the average Anglican, um, I am always told, is um, a 30-year-old woman living on less than $4 a day in the global south with a 50% chance of living in a conflict zone, and his life is probably already affected by climate change. Um, we heard on one of the calls this morning a reminder that the average person on earth, whether that's the average indigenous person or the average Christian or the average Muslim, is somebody who is poor and vulnerable and affected daily by these issues. They're incredibly important. <coughs> I've done a great deal of praying this week. I've prayed with the Earth Vigil, I've prayed in the cathedral, I've prayed with the Teze community and with the Archbishop of Canterbury and in the streets and on the march on Saturday. And I am convinced that prayer is essential if we are going to make progress on the technical and the political and the spiritual challenges in all of this. There's a massive power in faith communities joining up. 84% of the population of the world belongs to a faith community and we represent them. That's a fantastic responsibility, but it also means that there's a fantastic constituency there. We hear an awful lot about the technical challenges of, tra of transition and about the detailed and careful accounting and the sweat and the talk and the concentration and the sheer hard work of it all. But the challenges that we face are above all spiritual ones. And my prayer for this COP and more especially for what lies beyond it when we all go home on Friday or Saturday is that we will each divest our hearts of greed and apathy and hopelessness and selfishness, and that we will invest in our hearts in faith and hope and love and courage and generosity and justice. Thank you, Bishop Olivia Ray, for enriching our dialogue with your insights and actually for your Really brilliant remark about uh, about the elephant in the room and the pension fund of the Church of England. That actually reminded me of what Mark said as about fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which uh, emphasizes on another elephant in the room, who are fossil fuels uh, in every room, and especially in this COP26. Uh, they are also very much present, but invisible. So what we need to do, as you said, it's uh, to open our hearts and minds uh, to, to justice, to climate justice, to climate action, and act individually and collectively, divesting from fossil fuels and investing into renewable and clean energy, which is possible. And better world is definitely possible. And uh, the last to, to add on green jobs, because jobs are a part of green transition. And, uh, and actually, everyone is worried about jobs and losing jobs especially in coal-based regions. So accordingly to uh, international labor organizations, of course, we will lose 60 million of jobs based on coal, oil, and gas, but we will get few times more, few times more, over 100 million of jobs in green energy uh, sphere. And maybe it, it, this number can also grow exponentially to billion on numbers. So we are ready to lose those jobs for a better future and for creating a green future for our for next generations and for uh, our families and for some other families which will come after and will live on this planet. So and um, I will be, uh, I am very delighted and we are very delighted with partners to invite to speak a pastor, Pastor Ray Minikum, uh, who is the pastor of Scared three indigenous ministries and St. John's Anglican Diocese of Sydney. He traveled far 
to be there with us today and we appreciate this very much. And he said the sudden of a Kabi Kabi nation and the Guran Guran nation of Southeast Queensland who made an intervention in the 1995 UN Convention in Geneva on behalf of indigenous people at the first hearing of the draft declaration of the rights of indigenous people. He's a director of Punji Consultancies, which supports leadership business initiatives and community development projects and founder of Kafura Private Aboriginal School. He is currently working locally and internationally on climate advocacy issues on behalf of indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people. To you, Pastor Ray Minik. Let's just sit down together in peace as one. It's good to be amongst the faith community here today. And uh, you're the only ones that give me a small amount of hope uh, for my people and for my land, and not just any more land, for the land of other Indigenous peoples. One of the characteristics of Indigenous peoples is that we like to walk backwards into the future. We want to walk in the footsteps of our ancestors. The only other institution that does that very well, or very poorly really, is the church. It tries to walk backwards into the future based upon the teachings of its founder. But I think it sometimes is misguided by its own greed and lust for power. And it's one of those things that I'd like to just mention to you as indigenous peoples globally, that one of the things that sits behind this particular conference, COP, as well as the United Nations, is the things that we call the doctrine of discovery. And it's these doctrines, these uh, papal bulls that gave a lot of nations like Spain and Portugal and others to come and invade us and show no mercy towards us, whether it be Africa, South America, the Americas, Australia, these nations came and invaded us and they devastated us. They mutilated us. They committed genocide. And many of them still are on our lands and in our lands and to the people. And it's this particular doctrine, the doctrine of discovery, that gave these nations then permission to come up, not just only to take over our lands, but to institutionalize that to the ways in which they've designed their constitutions, whether it be the American constitution or the Australian constitution or the Canadian constitution, it's based within this lie called the doctrine of discovery. And they have then taken over our country. And so this doctrine came out of the church. It started by the Pope in the 14th, 14th centuries. And we're asking the churches to make a serious apology about this, to walk backwards into the future seriously with us. And in that apology, to make it based upon Zacchaeus principles. If you've harmed somebody, you will recompense appropriately, whether it be Africa, Asia, the Americas, the Pacifics, all of us are suffering from the ways in which these countries have invaded us and destroyed us. And what's so hypocritical about it when I come here is that these very nations at the United Nations are those same nations who are telling us how they're going to fix climate change. That's so hypocritical. And I get a little bit tired and deeply sick by some of the rhetoric that comes out of this. If you look, for example, at the Australian and perhaps even the Brazil pavilions here at, the, at COP26, you will see that the Australian pavilion is supported by the fossil fuel industry. And they've come over here to show the world how they're going to fix climate change in my country, on my land. What hypocrisy, what deceitfulness, what pure lies 
that are being told at this international forum here. And for us as Indigenous peoples, we see that the UN is giving permission to this to happen. Is the church giving permission also? This is the question that we, who are followers of the, the Jesus way, are asking our churches too. Because you too have supported your governments as well as your industries to come into our countries and gave them permission to do to us what you wouldn't do for your own families or your own communities. There is no love for us here. We don't feel it. We would love to, but we don't feel that love. Not from our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we sit in our pain and our suffering. We bury our dead daily. And we look for hope in the church, but it's an empty hope because we don't see the kinds of outreached hands that we'd love to see that Jesus demonstrated from the cross. And so we appeal to you again, consider the doctrine of discovery and the power that it has held in history over not only the church, but the nations that have set themselves up in our countries, in our nations, and then sought to destroy us, to exclude us, to marginalize us, and not hear our voices. We're sick and tired of it. We're fed up with it. And in terms of reinvestments or divestments, we know that the church has been a part of this incredible sin, this incredible evil. And it's done it deliberately and continues to do that deliberately. I don't see the church even coming to a place where it will repent of its sins or even think about that. And I don't know how to make that happen. And we, as Indigenous followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, we appeal to you again. Look at how you're reinvesting those divestments, because we sit here also with our hands ready to reconcile. And you will notice, too, in the reconciliation process or in the philosophy of reconciliation, it's always the most wounded will put out their hands and say, come on, let's be reconciled. It's not the aggressor. It's not the perpetrator. It's the victim. And we're the victims of all of this, even here at COP26. We are not the perpetrators. But here we are again, stretching out our hands as Indigenous peoples who are living in our lands now, under these foreign governments and under these foreign systems, who are taking all the resources that we have and hold dear to ourselves, including our knowledge, And it's like what Jesus said, you know, you do not throw your pearls before swine. And that's what it looks like for us. All of our pearls are being ripped up by pigs and dogs. And we just can't go any further along these lines as Indigenous peoples, whether it be Australians, Canada, America, South America, even the Maori people, and in the Pacific too, they're our family. And they have been totally wounded. We are suffering terribly, spiritually as well as physically, and we're also seeing our lands destroyed by this incredible thing called this climate crisis. So I come here with faith, but I don't come here with a lot of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Raymond Econ, for your prophetic inputs. And um, we are delighted to pass the floor to the next, spe to the next speaker, who is um, Sal uh, Sally Foster Fulton, um, head of Christian Aid Scotland and ordained Church of Scotland minister. 
Originally from South Carolina in the U USA, Sally studied in Columbia Theological Seminary and Glasgow University. She was ordained in 1999 and served as Associate Minister of Dunblane Cathedral from 2007 to 2016. She also served as a convener of the Church of Scotland, Church uh, the Society Council from uh, tw 2012 to 2016. Please, Sally, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I just want to take a minute and, and say straight up that there is nothing that I have to say that is more important than what we just heard. Um, and what we really, really need to do is stop and listen and learn from our sisters and brothers in the global south who have had nothing to do with this, but are suffering every single day, every single day, because of what we have done. And now we know what we've done and we have to stop. I know that this is messy, but I have to say, the science is telling us we don't have time to play around. We don't have time to take our time. We have to make these changes yesterday. And that's going to be really hard. And it's hard because absolutely there's greed involved. It's going to be hard because change is hard. But we have to do it. Um, James asked me to come and talk briefly about the Church of Scotland's route to disinvestment in fossil fuel. And I will do that. But I think maybe what I can add to this is some of the lessons we learned on that rather torturous route to disinvestment. Um, the Church of Scotland has debated this since 2018 at every General Assembly. It has come from the floor of the General Assembly. And so I think what that is saying is from the grassroots up, people have been saying, we need to pay attention. We need to disinvest. We need to take this seriously. And every year it was defeated at the floor of the General Assembly. Until this year, the Investors Trust made a financial decision to disinvest in fossil fuels because they are not financially viable. The good thing is that the moral imperative has been pushed into that space. And so we will not reinvest, because the door was still open, but we will not reinvest in fossil fuels unless the Investors Trust and the Faith Impact Forum of the Church of Scotland agree that that company is aligning to the Paris Agreement. Now, my personal opinion, and it's very personal, but that's okay, I'm, I think we're all entitled to them, is that we need to shut that door and lock it and say that because of our moral obligation to our sisters and brothers, we will not invest in fossil fuels again, end of. And I hope that that's something that the General Assembly will do. But we are making steps. One of the other wonderful things that has come from that decision is that there is now an ethical finance working group who are going to report to the General Assembly in two years to really say, not just about fossil fuels, but across our investment, what is the ethical way of doing this? And it is not going to be simple, but we're clever people. And you have to start somewhere. And so by in the next two years, the Church of Scotland will deeply grapple not only with fossil fuels, but with our investment portfolio in its totality, which I think is great. I wanna come back and talk a little bit about one of the things that was used, and, and, and I'm not saying this as, as, as being cynical, but a deeply held argument that I think is critically flawed, and that is about engagement with fossil fuel companies. The church has for a long time had negative screens in place. Negative screens, we will not invest in arms, tobacco, alcohol, gambling. We won't do that because the core purpose of that company or that investment is having a damaging effect on society. We know now that the extraction of fossil fuels is having a damaging 
death bringing effect on our communities and especially our sisters and brothers in the global south. So what we are saying is not demonizing. What it is saying is we will not invest in that because that's not the future we see. We will not do that any longer because our future and our present is at a different space and that's where we need to invest ourselves. I also would challenge the idea that if you take your money away, you lose your voice because actually you come with a different voice. The church has had a profound impact, profound impact on alcohol, tobacco, arms, but we don't invest our money. That does not mean our voice leaves. It means we come with a different voice. So I would say whether we disinvest or not, we need to talk, but that gives an authenticity that says we see our future in a different way. I think that there is a really important next step and that's where we invest. So it isn't just, it isn't enough to say, well, we'll take our money and we'll disinvest. But where are we going to put that money? Put our money where our morals are. So reinvest that money in renewable technology. Reinvest that money in communities in the global south so that they are not forced to follow our dirty footprints into the future. We walk backward into that future. But do that is going to take money and investment and commitment. Not one country. Not one has lived up to its promises in the Paris Agreement. Not one. That's appalling. It's shameful. And we should be ashamed and stop it. And I hope that we move forward in COP26. But I hope if we don't, that we don't stop yelling from the rooftops and taking our investments and making those changes. Because that's the only way that justice will come. I got this, I was handed this, we have climate conversations at 11 o'clock every morning at Sandiford Henderson as part of what Christian Aid is contributing. And they're interfaith conversations. And I was handed this card as I was leaving and, and I thought, I really don't have anything else I need to say. It's on this card. And it's from the Brahma Kumaras Environmental Initiative. And it says, following your dream. And it gives you a sentence. The most Power, the more powerful, positive, and detailed my vision of the future, the more likely I am to achieve it. We are running out of time. We need to own that and stop making excuses for ourselves and live out that gospel imperative to live justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And I hope we heard our brother. And I hope we listen to that wisdom and stop messing around. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sally and all, because that's incredible dialogue we are having right now. And there is a lot of Food for thought, we are, which is enriching our um, our time right now and our minds right now. But I will, I hope we will have time afterwards for questions and for some sharings. But now I would like to invite uh, to speak our speaker, uh, James Buchanan, um, right now um, campaign manager from Operation Noah, who previously worked for the Church of England as project coordinator of the pilgrimage to Paris ahead of the UN climate talks in 2015. And he has also worked for Christian Aid and Kefort. James, over to you, welcome. Thank you, Svetlana. Hopefully I'm looking in the right place for the camera. Um, thanks so much to everyone who's here in the room today. And thanks so much to everyone who's following along online as well. And um, Thank you to all the speakers for your um, inspiring contributions. Um, so as Lana said, I work for uh, Operation NOAA on the Bright Now campaign, which encourages uh, UK churches to both divest, disinvest from fossil fuel companies and to invest in clean alternatives. Um, so 
we've worked together very closely with uh, Laudato Si movement, uh, Green Anglicans, World Council of Churches and Green Faith, um, on a series of global divestment announcements. I really, first of all, just wanted to say how grateful we are for this partnership that we've, we've built over the last few years. Um, and um, as I think may have already been mentioned, just last month, um, a record 72 faith institutions from 10 countries, including 37 from the UK, um, announced their divestment from fossil fuel companies in the largest um, ever divestment announcement by religious institutions. Um, and these included the um, Catholic Bishops Conference of Scotland, as Lorna mentioned, and uh, all the Catholic dioceses in Scotland. Um, the Central Finance Board of the Methodist Church in the UK, which itself had kind of gone through some of that process of discussing, as, as, as uh, Bishop Olivia was talking about, that process of, you know, should we engage with, should we divest from these companies? They set a sort of 2020 um, deadline for when they would divest from any oil companies not aligned with the Paris Agreement. And they decided none of them were aligned with the Paris Agreement, and therefore they made that decision to divest. Um, as well as that, a number of Catholic dioceses in England and, uh, and also in Ireland, and um, two Church of England dioceses, um, Truro and Soda and Man, uh, the Presbyterian Church in Wales and the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, and three Buddhist organizations in the UK. And we're really delighted to see that multi faith um, element of this global announcement as well. I think it's already been mentioned a bit, but just to say briefly about fossil fuel divestment, and perhaps the aims of it. So it really seeks to remove the social license of the fossil fuel industry to continue exploring for new reserves of coal, oil, and gas when the vast majority of known reserves, as Marcus said, need to remain in the ground. Um, I think this, the topic of this, this uh, event today is obviously around, we're here at the COP, the just transition and need for climate justice. Um, there is a need for a just transition for workers in the oil and gas industry, and that's, as, as Lorna said, hugely important here in Scotland. What I would like to see is, is that the oil and gas industry doesn't fall off a cliff edge, but actually that we start that transition now and we start it fast. But I think it's also important to say that climate justice for me has to trump everything. And actually people in the global south, as Pastor Ray said, as other, others have said, are already hugely affected by the damaging consequences of the climate crisis. And we need to listen to those voices and that has to come first. So as well as fossil fuel divestment, so investment in climate solutions is hugely important. And um, some churches have already been engaging in this. I'd like to just maybe mention one example, um, which Bishop Hugh Nelson, um, a bishop in the Diocese of Truro, mentioned in a webinar that we did um, a couple of weeks ago. So he said, since divesting from fossil fuel companies, the, um, the Church of England Diocese of Truro has invested nearly two million pounds in infrastructure funds that are directly investing in renewable energy. So I think that's a great example, and I'd love to see more dioceses and national churches following their lead on this as well. Um, so while I've been here in Glasgow, I've um, obviously seen a number of faith groups and faith leaders um, who are calling for climate justice and calling for action from our governments. I think that's hugely important. I think as well, it's really important that sort of as faith groups, I think our political advocacy will carry more weight. It will have a bigger impact if we can get our own house in order ourselves and be seen to take, be taking action on these issues. And I think that's why one of the reasons why divestment and investment is so important. Um, just perhaps to mention a couple of things, uh, got some slides that hopefully you can see on the online here and in the room. Um, so in uh, the Church of England, which, which Bishop Olivia has mentioned, we're really grateful to the Diocese of Oxford for being one of the first dioceses to divest from fossil fuel companies. Um, there are now uh, well, in this graphic, you can see four, but it's actually five as of the weekend uh, just gone by, as Bishop Olivia said, the Diocese of Norwich has just voted to divest from fossil fuels uh, companies at the diocesan synod um, at the weekend. So um, that's really great news. As you can see from this graphic, there are, um, uh, well, four, now five dioceses that have announced their divestment from fossil fuels. There's actually a lot of dioceses that are no longer investing in fossil fuel companies, but haven't actually made a public commitment not to invest in fossil fuel companies in the future. And we want that to happen um, as, as soon as possible. Um, a lot of these, um, these dioceses have investments managed by CCLA, which, which Bishop Olivia mentioned, which made that decision not to invest in fossil fuel companies for financial reasons. But a number of those dioceses that are in that, uh, in the green, the green zone, let's say, the green, uh, um, in, uh, if you're looking at it as a traffic light system, a number of those dioceses that have made a commitment to divest from fossil fuel companies 
have investments with CCLA and they approached CCLA and said, we don't want to invest in fossil fuel companies in the future. And CCLA said, we have no plans in, in, you know, in any time soon to reinvest in these companies, which is good news. So those dioceses that have made this decision, and we want more to make that decision, um, are making a hugely important decision because CCLA now, I believe, will probably not reinvest in fossil fuel companies because there are these dioceses which are in the Church of England funds that have made that decision. So CCLA would actually need to inform those dioceses, and I don't think that's going to happen. Um, next slide. Yeah, Diocese of Norwich, which we just mentioned, has, has divested just in the last couple of days. We were delighted that Bishop Graham Usher, who's the lead bishop for the environment in the church, and actually voted in favour of divestment in his diocese. Um, he continues to support engagement at a national level, but supported divestment in his diocese. I think it's also important to say that these calls for divestment in all the different churches, it happened in the Church of Scotland, it happened in the Methodist Church, the United Reformed Church, and it's happened in the Catholic Church as well. The young people, the young adults, they are calling for divestment. They're calling to church leaders, to people in decision-making positions, to divest from fossil fuels. And um, there's a really good piece of research which Tear Fund did, which showed that young people, nine out of 10 of them, are concerned about the climate crisis. And only one in 10 of them believe that their churches are doing enough. I think that says quite a lot. Um, and I think one of the big issues that they often speak out about is on divestment. And that that's one of the first things they believe their churches should be doing. So I'll leave it there. Um, thanks so much to all of you who've supported this campaign and continue to support it and looking forward to the questions. Yes, thank you so much, James and all. And now we are opening and we are grateful to our audience today uh, who is with us physically and we are expecting some questions. And op there is an opening for Q&A session right now. And if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand and I will, be, uh, I will be following with you with the microphone. And please, if you also can and would like to ask a question directly to a specific speaker, if possible. And we will also will take a few questions from the Facebook, YouTube, and all social media for, so, for our supporters who joined us online, of course. So there will be a time for that. So, Q&A session open. Yes. Please introduce yourself very quickly first. My name is Val King. I'm a member of Christian Climate Action. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, and not just put uh, Bishop Olivier on the spot, about the, just, the, um, the argument for continuing engagement, but specifically what has been achieved through engagement with fossil fuel companies. I think we'll start from Renan, maybe, because the question was to a panel. Who would like to take it? Thanks, James. Yes, James. Thanks, Lana. Good, good question, Val. Um, I think for us, when, when this topic comes up, I think um, there are two things. One, people might argue that there's been some progress as a result of engagement. But what I'd say is, is that progress enough? And is it anywhere near enough, given the urgency of the climate crisis that we're facing? And I believe the answer to that is no. Um, and I'll just give a couple of examples from specific companies because I do think it helps to get into specifics. So to give do a couple of examples, um, Shell is planning to increase gas production by 20% in the next few years. We need to reduce oil and gas production, not increase it. Um, BP is planning to drill for gas on the edge of the world's largest cold water coral reef. And it's not just climate impacts, it's impacts on biodiversity, it's impacts on human rights. Um, Bishop Manuel Ernesto has spoken about the impacts of the climate um, of, of uh, Total, um, the French oil company in Mozambique, which led to the displacement of hundreds of thousands, a million people. Um, and Total is actually planning to increase uh, fossil fuel production in the Arctic in the next few years. I thought we'd gone beyond having this conversation, but obviously we haven't. Um, and in terms of ExxonMobil, maybe I could just briefly mention that the church commissions are still invested in ExxonMobil. And, um, and along with a group of other shareholders, um, did manage to get three directors on the Exxon board changed a few months ago. But I would like to hear what progress has there been from Exxon in the last six months? I've heard nothing, but absolutely nothing. So, um, so I think um, what I would add, I would add that 
I do appreciate those who are pursuing engagement with the fossil fuel industry are good people. They're seeking to achieve change. But I just believe the time for that has passed now and it's time to divest. Really quickly, I, I think one, again, going back to that engagement and the purpose of our engagement and going back to those, the reason for those negative screens, you know, if we followed the logic, then, and I've stolen this from a colleague, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, if, if we follow that logic, then we should keep our investments in tobacco and alcohol and try to work from within to make it a little less bad. Um, so I think, again, it's what's the purpose of that engagement and do we need to be invested in that product in order to engage? And I think the answer is no, we don't. Um, I, I defer to James, who will have the absolute up-to-date information on this. Um, I, I haven't followed the, um, the ins and outs of it very closely, but what I do know is that the, uh, the Church of England is committed to divesting by 2023 of any fossil fuel company which is not aligned with the Paris goals. So it isn't an open-ended engagement. It's, it's an engagement that has staging posts and has an endpoint. Um, and that's that's why I think it's a it's a credible um, um, uh, pathway to tread. It's not the one that I personally believe in, but I understand what's what they're trying to do. Um, yeah, so the engagement I, I think is we should be thinking about is is um, changing boards to close the companies down, wind them down. That's what we should be doing and and um, People throw back at me, well, what about all the renewable energy investments they're making? Well, let's be clear about that. Typically, it's about 5% of their investment is going into renewables. The other 90, 95% is going into more fossil fuels. Now, if you look at that as a percentage of their balance sheet, that's typically about 1% of their balance sheet. That doesn't tell me that these are companies are in transition. It's these huge expansion plans that James described that most concern me. Now, last week, I, you may have seen this, uh, a hedge fund in America, which uh, in capitalist in tooth and claw, uh, bought $750 million of shell to, to break it up. Um, and what they're planning to do is to have a growth company, which is the renewables part, and then a wind down part. And we need to be talking about winding the companies now. Now, if investors, whether it's the Church of England or anyone else is saying, we're engaging to close the companies down, thumbs up. But I haven't, he I haven't heard them say that. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. And uh, maybe we have one question from uh, social media and followers and supporters, please. Thanks, Lana. Uh, lots of questions have come in. Um, I'll direct this one to Lorna, if that's okay. Um, does divestment necessarily translate into green impact investment? I see Mark can probably answer this one better. Um, I don't think it necessarily does at the moment. Um, I think that the approach is that through a kind of divestment approach, it's adding one more screen to the portfolio of investments. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those investments are going in any particular um, direction. Um, I think what we need to be thinking of now is... Um, proactively what are the next steps in terms of investment and in terms of um, how we can use our investments as um, serious levers for, for change. And I like that quote that you, you gave, the more detailed we can be about the future, the more we can um, we will be able to, to reach that future. One of the programmes that I'm in, engaged in in Faith Invest is a, a huge initiative uh, called Faith Plans for People and Planet, which is to get all the faith communities across the world, so no shortage of ambition there, to outline in, in, in clear steps what they're going to do in the next seven to 10 years to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and to do it using all the different levers of change that faiths have. So you talked about voice and influence, about our educational establishments, 
about our transition to green energy, the transition to net zero. Um, so that's, that's a huge programme which sets will be then, will absolutely require significant investment because as the, the statistics that's done the rounds for me this week is that one about 84% of people adhere to a faith community. I've heard it in various different forums. So there's something in the ether about this. That's 84% who adhere to a values base um, obviously not all that 84 percent and not all faiths but the vast majority adhere to a vision of the world that involves protection of our environment and care for creation um, once that starts to rise up and the faith communities who have the assets the asset owners the owners of eight percent of the lands the earth's land mass according to the atlas of religions um, 64% of schools in Southern Africa. Once that mass agrees in some way or sets out on paper what the transition looks like, it's, it could be a pivotal shift. But as we've said many times today, and it requires investment, and myself and Mark are involved in some discussions around the scalability and also tier fund, around the scalability of that, those investments and making those investments a viable and a practical and a for the faith communities but that's an exciting opportunity which is emerging now and a one that that we really need to accelerate um, if i can just very quickly add um the university of california which is the one i know um, of the billion dollars they took out of fossil fuels they put a billion dollars into renewable energy um, and those are the kinds of things we should be looking at. And anybody who's been onto the Divest Invest uh, website will know that part of the divestment commitment is a commitment to invest 5% um, of your corpus into clean energy solutions um, as practical examples. Now, the one I know best is, as a group is a Catholic Impact Investment Collaborative. Um, the website's catholicimpact.org. And, and what they do is they publish the investments they've made on the positive side. And that's something actually any group could do. If you're going to talk about making the transition, put it up on the website. Tell us what types of initiatives you're supporting and what kind of investments you're making. And, and in more importantly, and we talked about the need for access to energy in the global south, tell us what you're doing there as well. And, and that's often the trickiest bit, but there's some really important things you could be doing, whether it's through philanthropy, which is important, but actually with your portfolios, either individually or as, as a group. One of the... Uh important aspects of indigenous people, especially my people, you know, for 60,000 years, we looked after our country. 200 years later, it's, you know, ruined. But just consider that as an investment, that indigenous knowledge that could look after country. They can show the world how to look after God's creation, because that's our relationship. And that's who we have our trust and our faith in, our creator not in the ways in which even the church is dealing with God's creation. Think of that and invest in some of the incredible indigenous knowledges that are out there. I mean, I'm part of a global university that we're trying to skill up our young people and we're not part of this, this whole knowledge base that you're talking about. It's a bit beyond our scope and perhaps even a bit beyond what we would like to see as our solutions to, to this global crisis. But we know our knowledge. We know how to look after country. We know how to turn this around because it's, it's knowledge that we got from our creator. It's not knowledge that we got out of a book or some other study. We got it from our creator and from our elders. That's why we walk backwards into the future in the footprints of our elders, because they taught us this. And we want to put that kind of knowledge back into this incredible debate that's going on. But I know that our voice doesn't seem to get heard. And, um... 
I would like to remind uh, us that we will have another divestment announcement day in 2022. Please join us and contact us. You will see in the chat box uh, our contacts, both Operation NOAA in the UK and Laudato Si Movement for Catholic Divestment and all our partners all over the world who support divestment uh, from fossil fuels and investment in the clean energy. And unfortunately, we are run out of time and we would, we would love to keep those fantastic speakers for two or three more hours. Immense gratitude to all of you for visiting us today, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us and your prophetic insights, which will become a good back background for our prophetic advocacy that our institutions will be doing. And again, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, those partners who made this uh, event possible and not only possible, but also a success as we all see. And these partners are Operation NOAA, uh, Green Face, uh, and Green, and, uh, Green Anglicans, and World Council of Churches, CAFOTS, KIAF, Tier Fund, and Christian Aid, and Eco Congregation Scotland. We would like to thank you all, and we would like to thank your audience who is here today for your attention, attendance, and for your um, active in engagement with us today. And please just stay. We will have some time for tea and coffee, and we can speak more, and we can exchange our opinions. And thank you for being here today. And thank you for our social media followers and those who attended and watched us online. We appreciate all of you, your time spent uh, with us. And we will we promise to organize more such an impactful events, which you will have a chance to join with such a fantastic speakers as you were today. Thank you all so much.